Good evening. Um, my name is Catherine Boboyan, and I am the director of the Armenian Studies program. I'd like to welcome all of you, some of whom I don't recognize, but I'd really especially like to welcome you to our Dr. Berge Haidostian Distinguished Annual Lecture. Um, this uh, annual lecture was established by the family of the late Dr. Berge Haidostian, a prominent and devoted physician um, in honor of his long-standing relationship with the University of Michigan and with the Department of Armenian Studies. Unfortunately, Mrs. Alice Haidostian could not make it tonight. She's here uh, in spirit, so I would like to acknowledge her as well, but we have instead um, her daughter, Cynthia Wil Wilbanks, and her son, Dikran Haidostian. Every year, we select a speaker from among internationally recognized scholars and artists who draw on subjects Armenian to reach larger audiences through different modes of expression, like the performing arts, but also to engage in broader discussion of human rights and humanitarianism. Recent Haidostian um, Distinguished Lectures have included last year Nicholas Kumjian, the prosecutor of the International Criminal Tribunal for both the former Yugoslavia and the Khmer Rouge. Um, invitees have also included the maverick uh, Taner Akcham, who transformed the field of Armenian genocide studies the film and visual theorist Mariot Baronian, the playwright, novelist, and actor Eric Borosian, and the director Atom Egoyan. Today, we are fortunate to have the film critic and director of the Per Denone Silent Film Festival, Jay Weisberg, to take us into the realm of moving images as testimony to past languages, forms, stories, and visions. My gratitude goes out to the Haidosian family for their loyal support that has made it possible for us to bring these distinguished lectures to the University of Michigan. And thanks to the Department of Film, TV, and Media Studies, our co-sponsors. And last but not least, I'd like to thank Naira Tumanyan, who just walked into the, the room, our programmer, uh, without whose really diligent and efficient work um, this would have not happened, um, at least, and flowed so beautifully. So thank you, Naira. Jay Weisberg is a historian with a knack for digging into the archives to unearth history's forgotten fragments and revisit them in the light of our present moment. From a plethora of aesthetic modes and socio-political contexts, first as curator and then as director, curator of the Gior Giornate del Cinema Muto, um, better known in English as the Per Denone Silent Film Festival, Weisberg has explored themes such as the after effects to the Great War, to create links between the then and the now of Raqqa, Aleppo, Mosul, and Homs, ancient cities that today look like flattened towns. Or consider, for example, his curated section on nasty women, which participated in the feminist respond, response to Hillary Clinton being called a nasty woman by you know who. Um, and Weissman's uh, highlighted in this uh, curated uh, partition films with strong female characters. These are just a couple of his curated motifs I have singled out to show you how Weisberg draws on the present to make people realize that silent cinema isn't dead, nor is it arcane. Every October, in Perdenone, in northern Italy, in the Friuli region, silent film enthusiasts, scholars, and archivists gather together by the hundreds to witness the latest work in cinema that was originally projected over a century ago. It is the first and largest and most important international festival dedicated to silent film. 
Weisberg engages the political as well as the more technical processes of recovering and restoring this film heritage. He has rediscovered lost films, identified or orphaned reels, and as a true historian, he has had chance encounters that have led to restorations um, of projects and the discovery of remarkable footage, his Ottoman project being one that you will hear about tonight. In order to revitalize silent film, from nine in the morning until midnight for a full week, all screenings at the Perdononi have live music, which can be anything from a single piano to piano and drums, or a chamber orchestra or full orchestra um, at the opening and the closing. The intensity of this annual experience is intended to incite a passion for cinema that clearly has a lot to say about the present. Weisberg's personal trajectory to Perdenone began during his childhood, and here I am quoting his own words. As a child, I must have read Ingri uh, Deloer and Edgar Parand Deloer's book of Greek myths hundreds of times, literally crying when reaching the final pages with their smashed statues representing the death of gods in whom I had invested so much of my imagination. Shortly after, while still a child, I discovered other fallen idols whose voices I also read yet never heard. Lillian Gish, Rudolf Valentino, Buster Keaton, Douglas Fa Fairbanks. They became my new deities, only slightly res re less remote than the ancients, though viewed by those around me as equally irrelevant relics of a bygone age. As an undergraduate here at the University of Michigan, where he majored in history, Weisberg confesses that rather uh, than sometimes studying, uh, he would find um, 1920s movie magazines and just sit in the library and go page after page after page and get excited about, say, Vilma Banke's wedding to Rod LaRoque, um, in case you don't know. Um, the <laughs> the American actor who married the Hungarian actress in a lavish and highly publicized wedding in 1927. A couple of de decades later, in Pordenone, Joy Weisberg uh, would write silent cinema versions of Greek myths. His voluminous catalogs for the three festival seasons he has directed since 1916 are marvelous guides to the week of visual wonders, treasure troves of knowledge, drawing from an enormous wealth of images kept at film archives. Weisberg's thematic selections represent a vast continent that over decades have the potential to transform the way we think and communicate. This is the archive from which he curates films to create new reflections and deep investigations that change the ways, among other things, stories from the past are told. Weisberg has also curated programs for the Bologna's Cinema uh, Ritrovato in, 19, in 2015, for example, to communicate the tragic events of the Armenian genocide, rarely seen documentary footage filmed between 1911 and 1923 were shown alongside a tribute to the very first Armenian directors, Patvakan um, uh, Barhordarian and Amasi Martirosian, and the silent films they made at the beginning of the Soviet era. As part of the program, the festival screened a print of the first Armenian film, Hamo Beknazarian's Namus, rediscovered at the Gosfilmofond Moscow, accompanied by the film's original music by Armenian composers. Tonight you will hear about his co-curated project, Views of the Ottoman Empire, which he embarked on in 2014, together with several archivists and independent scholars to identify what moving images remain, research their history, distribution and reception, and screen curated programs in both the countries where they were initially shot 
and among diasporic communities for whom film provides an emotional connection that is difficult to quantify. Tonight's lecture will discuss the identification and reevaluation of these little scene films alongside thoughts regarding their meaning for audiences today. Please joining, join me in warmly welcoming Jay Weisberg back to Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, thank you, Catherine. I don't think I've ever had a, I know I've never had an introduction <laughs> like that before. Um, and, and also my sincerest thanks to the, to the Armenian Studies Department, to Catherine, to Naira Tumanyan, to Maria Aude Baronian, with whom I first connected at a conference in London last year. And in addition, a, a very special note of gratitude to the Haidostian family, whose generosity has made this all possible. In early 2013, Elif Rongen Kainakci, the Turkish-born curator of silent cinema at the I Film Museum in Amsterdam, Marianne lewinsky Strolli, an independent film historian based in Zurich, and I began talking about what film exists from the Ottoman Empire. We were not looking for Ottoman cinema, that is, the nascent film industry in Turkey, whose origins can be traced to the years of the First World War, but rather moving images such as travelogues and newsreels, largely shot by Western cameramen in the territories that comprise the empire from the beginning of cinema in 1895 um, up to the Ottoman collapse in the early 1920s. The conversation arose both from our interest in the region and our realization of how little we'd seen from these territories, despite knowing that a tremendous amount of footage, and that's the emergency warning again, yes, uh, a tremendous amount of footage had been shot. The birth of cinema launched a race across the globe with newly formed companies sending cameramen out to the four corners of the earth in order to beguile armchair travelers and feed the public's hunger for this new form of entertainment. It's generally agreed that only about one quarter or less of all silent fiction film still exists. This number plummets further when looking at the cinemas of nations outside the United States and Europe. To give you an idea of the estimated 1,300 films made in India between 1913 and 1931, it's been suggested that 98% of them are lost. 98%. I don't like to hazard a guess as to how little survives of nonfiction film from any region, but the figure is significantly less than 25%. In addition, nonfiction was long the stepchild of film studies departments uh, where they received little attention and at archives where they still remain shockingly under cataloged. Adding to the problem, film preservation is an expensive business, even in this digital age, and archives often find it difficult to allocate precious resources to restoring travelogues and other nonfiction categories that lack the glamour of, say, a Douglas Fairbanks film or one made by Ernst Lubitsch. Furthermore, film archives are largely government funded, which means monies are first assigned to conserving the productions of the respective country, rather than material that might have been screened within that country 90 years ago, but was produced elsewhere. My colleagues and I separated Ottoman cinema from images of the empire because very little indigenous Turkish cinema survives and what does exist was notoriously difficult to access in the National Archive. Our goals were the following comb through the archives of the world to see what visual records of the Ottoman Empire still exist, identify the material, research in contemporary trade journals, magazines, newspapers, and studio catalogs what films were made and how they were exhibited, and put together specially curated packages of films that could be screened both within the territories that formed part of the empire, as well in festivals and showcases geared towards, towards diasporic communities, for example, the Arab film festivals in Copenhagen and Oslo. We agreed we would look for films showing places that might not still have been Ottoman when the footage was shot, such as Sarajevo or Rhodes or Sofia, but which retained traces of its Ottoman past. As for a cutoff date, I must admit we fudged that quite a bit. The Sultanate was abolished in November 1922, but it became too tempting to screen films from beyond this moment when the material was worth showing. I'll show you a clip uh, now, a film, to give you uh, an idea of the sort of thing that I'm talking about. And, sorry, to, to start it, to play it is how? No, that's the... Do I need to push something here? Okay, great. How do you do that? 
Okay. Um, so this is um, a French film made by Pate Frère, uh, probably around 1913. We don't yet know the original title. The print is in the collection of the Vienna uh, Film Archive, uh, though the scan comes from the I Film Museum in Amsterdam. So we first had Galata Tower, then Turkish City Views. The greatest wish of uh, religious Mohammedans is to be buried in this city. The color is original. Um, it's stencil colored, um, which was far more common than anybody realizes. About 80% of all silent cinema was colored. That means uh, something like this in the early years and then later on tinted or toned. When we're watching this, we also should be questioning, do we think this is staged? What might be staged here? This is shot by probably a French cameraman. Um, who are these women who are here? One woman is veiled, the other isn't. This is obviously a transitional period in, in uh, Istanbul, Constantinople at the time. They certainly know they're being filmed and they're looking at the camera. The picturesque cemetery overlooks the Golden Horn. And I just find these images stunning. I'm sorry, I didn't bring a piano accompanist with me. Um, <laughs> the streets are flanked by monumental graces of the distinguished families. Again, clearly there's a reason why there's another two, a couple of women here, one veiled, one not. A holy fountain. The little symbol on the top right is the symbol of the Archive I Film Museum. The entrance to the Ayyub Mosque where the Prophet Muhammad's sword is kept. <coughs> the sacred pigeons in the courtyard of the mosque. The birds who enjoy religious protection are nourished by the devout. stage for the camera. Pictures from the Bosphorus. Terra Hill. Uh, the big boulevard in the European Court of Pera, and for those of you who know Istanbul, this is Istiklal, uh, where a number of the buildings were designed by Armenian architects. Quite a number of them have been torn down recently because Erdogan has targeted uh, buildings designed by European or Western uh, architects. Uh, the former parliament building. Uh, Dolmabachi Palace is built entirely of white marble and was the residence of Sultan Abdulaziz in 1875. Pardon? <laughs> uh, 
the main gate of the palace. Okay, and so we should be doing what then? Yeah. We'll go down to the first floor stairwell. Okay. Okay. Just say, okay, fine. Um. We'll risk it. I'm sorry to do this to you guys. That's your job, that's fine. <laughs> okay, shall I continue? Yes. Clearly, um, while we're watching this now, we're thinking about questions of Orientalism, we're quest thinking of questions of Western gaze. Um, a, when this was made more or less from 1912, 1913, that is creeping in more than it would have earlier on when the entire world is exotic. So I've seen films of, of villages in the Netherlands where they go from uh, from village to village where each, each uh, town they wear a different kind of lace cap. It's ex shot exactly the same as I've seen films that are shot in Kenya at the same period. So the, the, the concept of, uh, of the other and the Western gaze happens a little bit later in cinema because at the beginning everything is exotic. Cinema is so new, it, 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 it's, all, um, it's all the cinema of attraction and the cinema of spectacle. Um, once my colleagues and I agreed to launch this project, christened Views from the Ottoman Empire, we were faced with multiple challenges, none of which I must add were surprises. First was locating the material. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, archives have been lax in cataloging their nonfiction collections, which can make searching databases under keywords extremely difficult or even futile. In no way do I mean to denigrate the work being done in these institutions, but financial resources are scarce and too often projects are determined by national demands rather than perilous states of preservation. Archives frequently receive donations from private collectors and the like, and processing these collections takes a tremendous amount of time, especially when they're on nitrate, the glorious yet unstable film stock used until the early 1950s. The material often arrives like this consisting of fragments gathered together in one rusty can, sometimes too sticky and fragile to unroll, let alone put through a viewing table. If there's a label on the canister, if, the information can often be incomplete or just plain wrong. There are further problems. In many cases, the films are in fragmentary form without opening titles. In addition, since these films were distributed internationally, with each country creating new intertitles in their own language, it's often the case that the German language title for a French film, for example, will differ significantly from the original, making it difficult to watch with something for which, uh, to match, excuse me, with something for which we only have documentary rather than visual evidence. A good example of what I'm talking about is the following film we'll be seeing, which first came to my attention in 2013 when it was screened at the festival I'm now directing, the Pordenone Silent Film Festival. The print exists at the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia as part of an extraordinary donation they received, the Coric Collection. It was catalogued under the tentative generic title, Middle East Travelogue, though thanks to the Coric family's scrapbook, the archive believed it could be a British produced film by the Charles Urban Company titled Train Journey from Jaffa to Jerusalem, provisionally dated between 1904 and 1908. That's an old um, label, or it's what they thought it was. So the train leaving the station in Jaffa.
sorry for the time coding in the uh, archive watermark, but it's the only way that we can get this. Like many travelogues of the period, it's difficult to understand the geography of it, why it go it's going from one place to another in the way that it's going. And you'll see that particularly clearly shortly. The blobbing is nitrate damage, quite common. Bethlehem. Back to Jerusalem, the Church of the Holy Sepulcher. It's wonderful to see a woman with a great big picture hat, very uh, European, uh, combined with other uh, more local uh, communities. Then we suddenly shift to Cairo. And this is the annual procession um, of the, the great covering for the Kaaba in Mecca that was done every year in, in uh, Cairo. Uh, you'll see in a moment they process with splendid, enormous tapers, candles, uh, as well as a, a camel with a great tent on its, on its back to house the precious uh, fabric that's going to cover the Kaaba. And yes, you can imagine this is great with live music. This particular ceremony was filmed many, many times throughout the teens and 20s. And they're also wonderful travelers' accounts. Often when, uh, when we do these packages, I'll read from contemporary uh, accounts of what was going on. So as you can see, the film quickly pivots away from Jaffa and Jerusalem and takes us on a rapid journey to Lebanon, Egypt, Syria, and back. Taking the Charles Urban reference, uh, which came from Australia, uh, the, the reference to it came from Australia, uh, as a lead, I looked through the company's catalogs that are housed at the British Film Institute and found a perfect match in the 1909 catalog to a film titled A Trip Through Palestine, which still does not explain why we then go to Lebanon, Egypt, and Syria, uh, in which each scene was conveniently identified, though the Australia print was missing two shots. But earlier, early film scholarship is a rather more complicated affair than most people realize. Urban was constantly reusing footage shot by his cameraman earlier and repackaging them so they could be sold as something new. Looking through earlier catalogs, I found descriptions of footage dating back to 1903, this is the 1903 catalog, that was likely reconstituted in the, being, in the film that we saw that was being sold in 1909. So here you can see uh, particular Asiatic Turkey, Jaffa arrival of a train, the market, uh, Jerusalem Gate, but there's more here than obviously than, than we've seen. We didn't see Beirut, we didn't see uh, parts of Damascus. So he's his company, rather, is re-editing everything, so it's very difficult to be precise as to when some of those shots were put together because it's a compilation. That's not the end of this particular saga for this film. In the inaugural program of Views from the Ottoman Empire presented at the Cinema Ritrovato Festival in Bologna in 2014, a film housed at the British Film Institute was screened and identified as a Lumiere production datable to 1896 to 1897. Yet when I saw it, I realized it was the same film we've just seen, with the difference being that the British print includes the two scenes that are missing in the Australian version. The misattribution to Lumiere was an easy one to make, given that the Lumiere cameraman, Alexandre Promio, was shooting in the Levant in those years. 
and yes, uh, quite a bit of footage survives. So you can imagine the emotional power today of seeing moving images from Beirut and Cairo, uh, among others, in 1897, particularly for locals. It was exciting to have located two prints at the same of the same film, but the story continues. At the Venice Film Festival in 2016, I was watching Bill Morrison's experimental documentary, Dawson City, Frozen Time, about the extraordinary discovery of 533 reels of nitrate buried in a former swimming pool in the Yukon. Yes, I know that sounds unlikely, but it's true. While viewing the documentary, I practically jumped out of my seat because there was the urban film identified as in and around Palestine with an attribution to Italy's Pasquale film studio. The archive in Canada, where the Dawson City prints are housed, came up with that identification because it had been spliced onto a longer travelogue in which some intertitles from another film had the Pasquale logo. So I've used this as a case study to give an idea of the challenges we face. Travelogues in this period were screened by showmen who frequently traveled from town to town. Prints would wear out or be edited down and repackaged all the time, making it especially challenging for archivists and film historians today to identify individual titles. The International Federation of Film Archives, FIAF, maintains a database in which each contributing institution submits information on all the films in their collection, or they're meant to, but as we've seen, when the films are un unidentified or misattributed, the database can't, of course, be of help in locating specific titles. Had I not been in each of the screenings where the three prints were shown, it's likely they remain unconnected. When my colleagues and I were discussing how to frame the Ottoman project, we forcefully expressed the necessity of combating a sense of nostalgia. It is perilously easy to watch moving images like the ones you've just seen and be lulled into the false idea that you've had a glimpse into a yearned for better past. I need hardly tell this audience that the early years of the 20th century were horrific decades in which war, famine, epidemics, and genocide left gaping wounds that have yet to heal. We've located a great deal of footage that is difficult to watch, such as the fertile plains of Gaza in 1917 on the same reel as the bombing of Gaza City's Great Mosque. I've had audiences weep while watching a fragment that lasts only 75 seconds of Damascus in 1925 after it was bombed by French forces. With this in mind, it became vital for us to try to find footage from Armenia and of Armenian refugees. Everyone here is intimately familiar with documents testifying to the Hamidian massacres in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, as well as the genocide some two decades later. We know the contemporary accounts from published and unpublished memoirs. We've seen photographs. Over the past few decades, much of this material is now relatively accessible at libraries and on the web. What's missing from the visual record are the films. And yet moving images have an immediacy, a potency that gets under the skin like nothing else bearing witness, notwithstanding concerns about point of view and manipulation, in ways that have generated public enthusiasm for a cause otherwise easily forgotten or denied. I'm not here this evening to declare that a vast trove of moving images from Armenia have been discovered. Sadly, not that much survives, but films do exist and more are waiting to be identified. What I find frustrating is how rarely historians writing on this period consult not just film archives, but contemporary motion picture journals, where tantalizing information can be found about what was shot, by whom, and for what purpose. The role of American missionaries in raising awareness of the Armenian plight has been well studied, and the use by the early missionaries of lantern slides to illustrate these lectures is fairly well known. For example, uh, Loretta Cornelia Van Hook, regularly returned to the US for lecture tours following her extensive travels through Persia and the Caucasus using slides that included a number of Armenian subjects. As you can see here on the left, uh, Catherine, uh, Persia, its scenery, life, people, and religion, uh, and the right-hand column of uh, uh, Armenians in Persia. Um, and for those of you who have worked uh, with the Hamparzum Arzumanian papers here at the University of Michigan, uh, Mrs. Van Hook's name might be familiar as she was a correspondent of his. We've already, we already get mention of atrocities. On the right-hand slide, Erzurum Massacre, as one of the slides shown by the Reverend J.T. Ladd. Yet just a few years later, with the increasing ubiquity of motion pictures, a number of lecturers incorporated film, not just slides, most often as a means of drawing attention to the situation in Eastern Anatolia and Cilicia. I'll come to those kinds of films in a moment, but before then, I'll return to travelogues and the dashing man we had on the poster with the wonderful fur hat, Giovanni Vitrotti. 
Born in 1882, Vitrotti was the leading director of photography for the Societa Ambrosio, who in 1911 spent time in Russia, the Caucasus, and the Ottoman Empire, shooting places including Yerevan, Echmiadzin, Mount Ararat, and Batumi, for travelogues lasting from 5 to 15 minutes that were distributed worldwide. As of now, we've only been able to identify one of these films, Ani, La Città delle Mille Chiese, Ani, The City of a Thousand Churches, discovered in the early 20th century collection of a Swiss Jesuit priest, the Abbe Joseph Joie. So again, another Italian film the, with a German distribution copy. One of the things I find remarkable about this particular film is having spent two full days in Ani about 12 years ago, nothing has changed. Or almost nothing has changed. I'll show you one thing that has. So this particular print was collected, as I said, by a Jesuit, um, Swiss Jesuit, who used them to tour around as, for educational purposes, which it wasn't all that uncommon. This is what's changed, is that uh, apparently in 1911, the, um, the altar was still decorated uh, with a copy of Raphael's Sistine Madonna. Um, whether that was staged for this particular film, which I have a tendency to doubt, or whether perhaps uh, members uh, of the Christian community in, um, in Kars came and, and still used it occasionally, that I have not researched. The figure who's walking is probably an associate of Vitrotti's, used for scale. They call us a Tartar temple, but actually it's one of the mosques on the site. Of course, another difference is now because it's on the border, um, parts of it are not accessible. All of these archival finds are fortuitous discoveries, lucky survivors like this. But what survives gives a very inaccurate picture of what was produced. And part of our job as historians is to research what remains lost. We know how frequently Armenia was reported on in the newspapers at the time. In 1915 alone, the New York Times ran 145 articles on the atrocities, and Woodrow Wilson famously declared in 1919, quote, 
the whole heart of America has been engaged for Armenia. They know more about Armenia and its suffering than they know about any other European area. Jay Winter's fundamental volume, America and the Armenian Genocide of 1915, contains essays by various scholars detailing America's response to the genocide, and Thomas C. Leonard's contribution to that book discusses the role of the media, yet film is conspicuous by its absence. To be fair, tracing what was produced, as well as the reception of these films, was until recently extremely difficult, since entertainment industry magazines from the era were never indexed. Fortunately, the Media History Digital Library has revolutionized scholarship by scanning thousands of pages of searchable texts, opening up the floodgates of research in mind-boggling ways. See, simply typing in the keyword Armenia brings up a wealth of previously unavailable references, though of course one has to be careful. An intriguing hit in the billboard from 1910 wasn't about the country, but a plug for an appearance in Wheeling, West Virginia by Mademoiselle Armenia, the Egyptian sacred snake dancer, who was a featured performer with the dainty Paris burlesques, a vaudeville troupe based here in Michigan. Other times, we come across tantalizing one-line references that leave us frustrated by the lack of further information, such as this advertisement from July 1st, 1905, which mentions a short reel entitled Abduction of Armenian Princess. The majority of titles mentioned in the ad are actualities, that is nonfiction, with however at least one comedy thrown in, the last title at the end. Uh, so the lack of any further detail makes it impossible to imagine what exactly this film may have contained. As you've seen from the previous films I've shown, European companies led the way with travelogues, yet because the digitization of many European film magazines remains slow and without a devoted search engine, finding references requires more laborious research. The websites such as the Fondation C'est du Pâté's invaluable database of all pâté productions are a crucial tool. In addition, in France, Again, Gaumont has digitized hundreds of hours of newsreels, which are available to scholars, which means that we have access to such marvels as a procession in Etchmiadzin from 1912 with Patriarch George V and images of Armenian refugees in Trabzon from 1915. Similarly, a Europe-wide project to digitize hundreds of hours of footage from the First World War resulted in the European Film Gateway 1914, which saw 21 European film archives pooling resources, digitizing 740 hours of moving images between 1914 and 1918, along with 6,100 film-related documents, most of which are open access on the net. These, con these two contain images of Armenia and refugees. Once the war ended, of course, more cameramen flooded into the former battle area, some on the pay of studios, others hired by the American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief to document as far as possible the atrocities and refugees. In many cases, this footage was incorporated in newsreels, um, as we can see in this article from September 21st, 1918 in Moving Picture World. Um, the story of the invasion of Armenia, one of the bloodiest pages of the history of the present war, has been filmed. Oops, did I just do that? Oh, uh, no, okay, good. Um, and brought to America by the American Committee, uh, and is the current relief of Paramount Bray Pictograph, the magazine on the screen. And then here in, in August 1919, in a short article about Dr. Lincoln Wirt's series of church lectures, which states that the moving pictures illustrating the lecture are said to be among the best produced. Wirt is probably a name many of you know, he was working with the American Committee and was accompanied by a cameraman from the International Film Service, Glenn Russell Carrier. They left the United States in January 1919 with between 20,000 and 75,000 feet of film, reports vary, in order to, quote, record the conditions as they are found for permanent records of the atrocities of the Turks and Huns during the war. Carrier would send the footage back to the States where it was edited into newsreels released by Hearst and Universal with titles such as Aid for Suffering Victims of Turkish Savagery from the summer of 1919, showing members of the American Committee, committee distributing bread and soup to Armenian refugees. Also, Armenian Orphans and a Tribute to Uncle Sam, Constantinople, Turkey, released in February 1920 with the intertitle Inmates of a Great Orphanage Greet Admiral Mark L. Bristol and Major Davis D. Arnold, Chiefs of the Near East Relief Committee, Boy Cobblers Provide the Shoes for the Orphans, Admiral Bristol Refuse Some Soldiers of Tomorrow, Orphans All, and The Hope of Free Armenia. That's 1920. Not all the footage was designed for release, however. When Admiral James Harbord arrived in Turkey in 1919 to investigate the possibility of a US mandate for Armenia, he brought with him at least one cameraman. 
That footage, which exists today at the National Archive in Washington, D.C., is available online. And if we can watch a little bit of that. We're fast forwarding a little bit, and I'm going to fast forward even more. Actually, we could go to like a minute. I always said 11, let's go to 13. Oh, that's fine. 12 is good. The image is uh, of this online are, 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 are murky, but the footage includes images of Armenian soldiers and cars, as well as Admiral Harbord meeting with Prime Minister Alexander Katizian while reviewing newly minted troops in Yerevan. I'll let this play a moment while I talk uh, and mention the difficulties locating so much of this kind of footage. I was in Yerevan in 2013 and met with the director of the National Archive to see what film existed from the period. She told me that any footage that had been there from this time had been confiscated when the Soviets invaded in late 1920. Now, I don't know whether that's true or not, because what image did they have, what moving footage did they have, and where was it kept? Clearly, there wasn't any archive in Yerevan at that time in 1920. So what, where it was stored, if indeed this is true, we don't know. With the breakup of the Soviet Union and the reconstitution of the Armenian Republic, the archive requested the material back. However, Russia's archive of nonfiction film located on the outskirts of Moscow and Krasnogorsk responded by saying that they would send copies of the material to Yerevan, provided the Armenian archive paid for the digitization and shipping, something the impoverished institution, which can barely afford to heat the building, uh, could cover. So this is Yerevan. That's James Harbour, obviously. We can stop it there. There. Um, coverage of this activity in the American press has been well researched, uh, uh, yet the, the role of cinemas as rallying spots for the cause of refugee relief has received scant attention. Here I'm illustrating an advertisement from the magazine Camera from February 7th, 1920, but this sort of thing had been going on for some time. I found a reference in the moving picture world from January 27, 1915, excuse me, 1917, that's crucial, uh, for a benefit screening to raise funds for Armenian Syrian refugees held at the Princess Theater in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. Now, Hopkinsville, Kentucky at that time had a population of 9,500 people, and I find it noteworthy that movie theaters were sites for collecting aid money already in 1917 in areas that as far as I'm aware, did not have a, a demonstrable Armenian uh, emigre community. Uh, so saturated was the media with news and calls for donations that a backlash, uh, perhaps inevitably, uh, occurred, as we see in this disturbing article from Harper's Magazine in 1920, which I haven't seen referenced very much in the literature, written by Clarence Day Jr., a writer whose most famous work, Life with Father, was adapted by Orson Welles for a Mercury Theatre radio broadcast and then in 1947 was made into a movie directed by Michael Curtiz starring Elizabeth Taylor. That's just a little brief bio of the author. The article goes on for several pages with Day recalling how his father was perpetually infuriated by Armenian rug merchants described in baldly racist terminology who constantly tried to sell a susceptible wife carpets. Day goes on to rail against the constant demands on the public sympathy and wallets, and while at the end he almost grudgingly acknowledges that Armenians have been through horrific experiences and deserve our compassion, the overwhelmingly negative portrait of a whining, insistent people is shocking. I'm sorry, the, the scan, unfortunately, online is really not very good, but if we can see, um, uh, he talks about a, a severe annoyance with them has begun to appear. It's an awful thing to say, but they have asked for help so much that they are boring us. Moving to a happier note, I happened upon a remarkable article um, published in an educational film magazine from April 1921, which reports that an Armenian refugee in the United States attended a screening in which a newsreel, like ones of the ones we've seen, showed an orphanage back in Turkey. 
According to the article, she recognized her lost four-year-old son, Sarkis, on screen in the orphanage. She contacted the Near East Relief Committee and with their assistance was able to bring her child to America to join her. The story fairly pulsates with melodrama and it's impossible to confirm its truth, though it may have been reported in other publications with further details. We don't know what newsreel it was that led to this remarkable discovery, but the story offers us a revealing picture of the ubiquity of such images as well as their importance for audiences of the time. Given the wide-ranging nature of this talk, I haven't been able to speak very much about how we read these images, which obviously is a vital part of our work. Earlier on this evening, I discussed the difficulties of identification and the often fragmentary state in which these films survive. Before screening the last Armenian images I'll be presenting this evening, I want to give an example of why we need to be careful about how we interpret what we see. Last year, a small archive in the Italian city of Ivrea near Genoa contacted me to let me know they'd just preserved a previously unknown newsreel entitled Invasione delle Truppe Tedesche nel Belgio, the invasion of Belgium by German troops from 1914, and asked if I'd like to see it. When I played the film, I was aghast. Here was a piece of German propaganda made just one month after Germany invaded Belgium, which had been distributed in Italy and surely other parts of the world shortly after. Can we move this to minute, uh, one, uh, one minute, 58 seconds? A little before? Yeah, perfect. Early on while watching this film, I froze in my chair, literally. Here's a peaceful panorama of the main square in the town of Tamin. Few people today will even have heard of the place. Yet just one month before the camera recorded these images, a significant part of the population was rounded up at night and put inside the main church. The German soldiers then pulled a group out and massacred 373 people, probably raped quite a number of the women. Yet imagine if we didn't have the opening title or other parts of this film when you didn't know what happened in Tamin. You might imagine this to be a, just a nice panorama of a tranquil town. You've got people just casually walking about, and yet this was the site uh, less than 30 days earlier of one of the significant early atrocities of the First World War. We can stop it. I bring this up here in order to introduce you to the final part of my talk. In 2007, a colleague working for Lobster Films, an independent archive and distributor based in Paris, was walking um, down a street at night in Amsterdam and passed a photographer's shop where the owner was using these little cans of film that you see here now as window dressing. She knew they were old and called the owner of Lobster, Serge Bromberg, who the next day phoned the shop owner, who said the cans had negatives in them and probably weren't worth much, and besides, he had a whole bunch in the back of his store. Needless to say, the next day, Serge's partner drove to Amsterdam and bought the entire collection. When they began to look at the material, they were intrigued, but didn't know what it was that they had. It looks like a nice film, uh, yeah, what they had, okay. See if you can play this. It's a sugar cane. It's quite, sh the next three films are quite short. So what is it we've just seen? It looks like a nice film of young boys de delightedly munching on sugar cane. Yet what are those ruins in the background? Where is this taking place? After looking through a number of the other roles, Serge and his colleagues were able to identify the filmmakers as a pair of priests, the Abbé Moulson et Chevalier, who traveled in the Holy Land in the late 19th, early 20th century. When the films were first screened at my festival in 2007, they were identified as images from Palestine. Yet something didn't quite sit right with that identification. Several years later, in further consultations with historians, more analysis of the film stock resulted in a remarkable realization. 
The films were taken immediately following the massacre of Adana in 1909, when an estimated 30,000 Armenians were killed and 4,437 Armenian buildings torched. Can we play this? These titles are modern, by the way. And that's what we're about to look at now. And one more. Orphan. I have to admit, after finding that article about Little Sarkis's mother identifying her son through a film in 1921, I did wonder, did any parent watch this as well and perhaps recognize their child among the orphans? Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to take some questions. I don't know anything about immigration policies during the Wilson uh, administration. Uh, how easy or difficult was it for Armenians to get into the United States if they were fle fleeing violence? Um, I think some, there are probably some historians here who could answer that much better than I could. Does anybody want to take a? They, they had special dispensations to come in. OK. okay. But was there a quota? Post-genocide period. And in the early 20s, okay. before it became difficult, more difficult. Okay. Okay. Anyone else? Yeah. Here, I'm going to throw you oh, out here. Um, thank you for that great talk. <laughs> uh, I was just really curious, um, since you said that these films kind of come from an era that predate um, Western gaze. Uh, the, the later ones do, not the earlier ones, mm -hmm. I would say. Uh, I was just curious if we know anything about what kind of films were shown in Ottoman territories or if anything circulated there and 
you see an analog between the two? We do know, um, because the newspapers of the time tell us, um, and both not only the ones that in, in Ottoman Turkish, but also the emigre papers, because there are uh, significant numbers of French language newspapers, all of that sort of thing. And in fact, the first, uh, the first uh, film exhibitor in, in Istanbul, in Constantinople, was French. Uh, so we have all of those records, and they showed a variety of things like they would in Paris, more or less. So that means newsreels, comedy shorts, then later on, of course, it, it, the, the, the presentations become longer once feature films come in, but there's always that mix of, of newsreels, comedies, and, and, and features. Often have nothing to do with each other. So it, it can be quite a disconnect for audiences now to think of a film um, and a, a really good example, this wasn't in necessarily in, in Ottoman times, this was um, uh, in the times, but this was in, in France. Um, I found a reference to a screening of a newsreel about um, French soldiers who were mutilate, mutilated in uh, 1915 during the First World War and being fitted with prosthetic devices. And then that was playing right before a comedy called Those Endearing Young Charms. So there is no correlation at that time between the different segments of a program. But more or less what's playing in, in Ottoman territories is the same everywhere. Uh, and that's not just true within Turkey proper. The cinemas in Damascus, Aleppo, Cairo, um, we have really good records of how many cinemas were that there were, how when they opened in, in all presses, including in US presses. So uh, the American consuls from these different regions would uh, write back to film magazines. They were solicited to, to give information about the business. Uh, and it's through that actually that I've discovered that the first traveling, the first film exhibitions in the Gulf was 1908, um, because the U.S. consul in Oman uh, was reporting back of a traveling American showman who was showing films n privately to the royal, to the to the members of the aristocracy, but also to the public. And then he crisscrossed the Gulf. He went back and forth between Iran and and, and the Gulf and went up to Basra uh, in 1908. Yeah. Jay, thank you very much. It was uh, really fascinating. I'm curious, though, as you've put this together and, and it perhaps gets some additional attention and visibility, would you expect that uh, some additional works or opportunities might arise for you to add and um, expand on some of the uh, findings that you've Absolutely. so far this discovered? Absolutely. This is a real fragment of what we have. Okay. Um, there, there's a tremendous amount, and I, I particularly geared this towards Armenia, but we... Um, uh, from e everywhere throughout the entire the entire region, we found extraordinary films of Luxor in 1912, um, uh, Constantine in Algeria. That's just stunning. Um, I just recently discovered an absolutely stunning film from 1919 of um, Zahle, the valley in in, in Lebanon, a, a place that I never would have imagined would have been filmed at that time. So, they they are there. There's a lot that exists, but it's not cataloged and it hasn't been preserved and it hasn't been digitized. And that also uh, has hampered what I can show here because it has to be something that's already been digitized by right. the archives. And particularly um, since, um, you know, um, since Armenia is in London, the, the BFI is going to be spending more money on digitizing British films um, than there are other things in their collection. And that's not just true there, it's everywhere. everywhere. Uh, I've yeah. been able to get, there, there's some extraordinary films in Warsaw uh, sole survivors that uh, I've finally been able to get them to get find the funding to restore them. Yeah, great. Thank you. Welcome. Did you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, I think. Thanks. Uh, thanks again for your uh, talk. It was very fascinating. Uh, I was actually really surprised by your first film of uh, Constantinople in 1913. Can you go into a little more about how uh, it was colored? Was the, so the color was added in the restoration process? No, the, the color was, uh, well, um, it, it, that period, many, many films were stencil colored. So for every frame of a film, there was a, a, a stencil that was made and you had factories full of mostly women who would sit and laboriously color each frame, frame by frame, and that means each print. That was a faster way of doing it than a little bit earlier when it was hand painted. So hundreds of women sitting in these studios, and we have photographs of the, of the studios, yeah. um, with tiny paintbrushes laboriously painting in the most extraordinary colors, really remarkable colors. And nitrate, because nitrate stock uh, has a high silver content, it me and, and also the kind of um, light that was used in the projectors at the time meant that there was a glow to it that 
we, to this day is still impossible to fully um, reproduce. So when this was digitized, they're going back to the original colors and, and using color correction to try to uh, stabilize the colors that are there, but that is original. Um, a little bit faded, but um, original. And as I said earlier, most films were like that at that period. So the problem was is that in the 1950s and 60s and 70s, when archives began to think, oh, our films are disintegrating, let's preserve them onto celluloid, um, it was cheaper to do it on black and white. So they preserved it on black and white. In many cases, they threw out the nitrate. So we don't have the original material. We can't go back to the original colors. Um, more and more archives have become aware of this problem and they're, they're, they're hunting down for the nitrate to see if they can reproduce things like what we saw with Constantinople. A little bit later on, travelogues would not, they wouldn't have paid the t done that much. They would have been a tinted or toned, so just basically two-toned. And that too can be a remarkable range of colors. I've seen violet, I've seen orange, yellow, blue, red, um, really a, a extraordinary images. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, really, thanks a lot for this fascinating talk. I have actually a very simple question, like based on all the material you've screened, because most of the material we saw was very much from the public sphere, are there actually any things you came across with regard to the Ottoman space that would you say really kind of like gets us to the private realm? And what was maybe the most personal things that you came across during the screening? Hmm. Nothing that I can think of. There's, there's a, a very interesting film, more or less from the same period of Constantinople, also with amazing color, Pate, um, where at the very end, the last shot is a woman who's lifting her veil off her head and revealing it. But she's clearly a model. She's, 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 she's styled in, in uh, her hair is Western, her makeup is Western. Um, so that is very much Orientalism personified. Um, but private spaces, no. We have images, we have footage of the Sultan, um, but that's really it. There are private films, homemade films that survive, and homemade photographs. I know of some in Egypt, of the royal family in Egypt uh, from the 20s, but um, those aren't in, in public archives. Yeah, otherwise it's, yeah, private spaces are really, really difficult, particularly as you can imagine in this period. Yeah. Thank you. You gave us such a beautiful panorama of the complexity of doing research on early film. Um, and so I would want to even, Thank you know, you. kind of go deeper into that complexity because when you showed <coughs> the first uh, film about Istanbul in 1912, 13, I wondered whether what you did, namely to talk about what we are seeing would have happened in the audience when it was shown at particular moments. And so when you talked about the Swiss Jesuit who uh, would go on educational tours, you know, I started imagining what he would have done. Would he have, you know, kind of spoken during the performance? Would he not have interrupted the cinematic aura and maybe just framed it before and after? And I know that there are many things one cannot know precisely, but you know you know so much more, uh, and so I want to imagine the scene of the education of film and how verbiage comes in. Uh, it's almost certain that the Abbé Joie would have spoken and, and would have been lecturing during his, his screenings because the whole purpose for him was educational. With, the, um, with the, the Istanbul film, it was a pate film, and so that would also have just been, made the, been making the rounds of, of regular uh, cinemas and motion picture houses. And in that case, there would, have been, there would not have been any kind of lecture before or after. It would have been completely straight. In Japan, that's different. There was always somebody who was accompanying the films, a benshi. But uh, in, outside of Japan, for the most part, unless it was uh, specifically geared towards educational Western, uh, not Western, ed educational uh, environments, lectures, often a combination of, of motion pictures and slides, then that would have been accompanied by um, by, by, by discussion and by talking. All right. Sorry. Oh. Yeah. Um, my recollection is earlier you mentioned you tried to 
cut out sentimentality from your festival and all that? Nostalgia, yeah. I'm sorry, nostalgia. I'm wondering in, in the films, was there originally material that, you know, because you wanted to reduce nostalgia, you had to expunge it or you had to cut it out? Or, you know, things that had agendas and all that? that uh, oh, no, we, 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 we keep that very much. But what, what, when, we, when we do presentations, because we, we tour um, various places, former uh, parts of the, of the empire, um, with specially curated package tours and live music to bring these films to the people whose it's part of their heritage, it's part of their culture, um, but the films are sitting in archives throughout the world so they don't have access to them. And where we do presentations before the film and after and it's more in the presentations, in the lectures, uh, where we, we specifically say don't think of this as a nostalgia trip. Don't think that just because you're seeing these beautiful images in colors you've never seen before, that this is giving us an insight into a glorious past because the glorious past wasn't there. But it's very easy to be lulled into that because you're seeing this in particularly something like Damascus, for example, when you see that shot in 1912 of the Moisin and, and it's making this, three, this panoramic view of a city that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and Gaza, as I said, particularly when I saw the film of Gaza where you see these beautiful green fields and then suddenly you see the, the, the soldiers bombing the, the Great Mosque. Um, yeah. And refugees as well, which clearly, uh, and I haven't really shown, I showed the, the bit of uh, orphans, but there are quite a number of, of films, fragments, unfortunately, that show refugees. I just discovered, in fact, that the Greek army archive has quite a lot as well, because of course the populations of Greeks and Armenians were fleeing at the same time. Um, <laughs> So there's a lot of that. A tremendous number of cameramen, for example, during the burning of Smyrna, of Izmir, who, who recorded the, 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 the conflagration. Hi, um, thank you again. And I just had a question, like, do you have any idea of how large this movie, the cameras were and all the apparatus that these people were taking around with them? I can't even imagine this. N not so bad, yeah. Uh, I, I, unfortunately, I, I couldn't show uh, any, I didn't have any photographs of that, but they had traveling, traveling tripods, and they weren't so big, so it was something that you could carry. And it was all mechanically? Oh, yeah. hand-cranked. Hand-cranked. Yeah, up until, uh, up until probably um, mid-teens, maybe, particularly for travelogues, it would have been hand-cranked, which means you have to be very careful, of course, about not making it jerky. Um, I want to ask a question about what I was hoping we were going to see. Are there movies or are there any films about the genocide itself or its immediate aftermath? Uh, uh, of, of refugees. Of refugees. There, are, there, are, there are images of refugees, but more than that, not that we found. I'm convinced that there must be, um, or that at least that they were shot. Yeah. And we don't know how much Carrier, when he went with Harbord and with um, Wirt, uh, not Carrier went with Wirt, not with Harbord, but we don't know how much carrier had shot. If he had 20,000 to 75,000 feet of film and, and the idea was to set out to record the atrocities, then what did he shoot? And we don't have that information. Which of course is another reason why it's so easy to deny it. Hi. Um, I'm curious about the process. So when you stumble upon a piece of media that's unidentifiable, that doesn't have a label, what are the first steps that you take to either identify geographically where it comes from or where the, where the people are from or what time period it takes place in? Um, the first thing you do is you look at the material itself because it, a lot of the studios will put on the edge codes uh, of the films uh, their company names. So Pate, Stock, it's quite easy to see. Uh, Goma, it's quite easy to see. So at least that way you get a studio if you get that far. Um, otherwise, it's just it's simply a question of asking the right people um, particularly if it's a fragment with no intro titles, with nothing identifying it, you're just looking and, and hoping that you ask enough people and ask historians. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do more and more is, uh, I was explaining to Catherine earlier, we're trying to uh, uh, break down the, 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 um, the, the walls between the disciplines and we're talking to costume historians who can identify costumes that we can't um, anthropologists, historical anthropologists, who can say that is a particular Berber tribe and from Algeria, because we have some amazing films from Algeria, but 
we're not as film historians, we can't identify them. Um, dance historians as well, because there are, there's an extraordinary film from around 1901, uh, beautifully hand colored. It, it says Dance of the Uled Niles. Talking to a dance historian, she told me there's no way that that woman who's moving her hips this way instead of this way is a real Algerian Ouled Nile dancer. So she was probably somebody who was in Paris for the 1900 Expo and was doing these dances uh, in a very Orientalist way. So we need to be doing more of that. We need to be bringing people together, particularly historians, as they say, um, anthropologists, to be able to make these identifications. Archives, for the most part, don't have the resources and don't have the time, so it's something that happens more independently. My question is uh, twofold. Um, one of the, my first question is: um, I'm very fascinated by you know by uh, the idea of including movies and and you know um, um, this footage, this sort of footage, into my own research. Um, when I go back and look at travelogues written by Westerners on Lebanon, Syria, Armenians, Turks, I, all, we're always like um, anxious about decolonizing these these primary sources because it's um, it's written by what? How do we? Uh, so f uh, obviously, when we're going to be looking at these footage, at this footage, it's it's I'm assuming it's it's shot and and handled by. Western white men, right? Um, all but, but one cameraman. Yeah, okay. who I, I, I'll talk about him in a second. Yeah, so yeah. there's the issue of decolonizing it to include it into our, our own work, and how do we include it? That's my first question. Uh, my second question is, in the region, in the Arabophone region, I'm mainly talking, uh, where where would you say is like the best um, archive for Arab <laughs> uh, for movies on, on, let's say, Lebanon, Syria? Right. It's probably in, in, in Europe or here, right? It's not, like, yeah. I don't think Lebanon, and, or. Syria, let's forget about them. Like Lebanon, they don't. Cairo, um, it's a disaster. Yeah, um, even the governmental archive. Like, disaster. Yeah. 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 So it, we would have to rely on Pate and Gomo. And exactly. Yeah. So, f for example, yeah, definitely. But then for, um, the first Arab cameraman who's known was a Tunisian man named Albert Samama Chikli, who worked uh, first in, in Tunisia. He was, um, it helped that he was friends with the royal family, a uh, Jewish Tunisian family. Uh, Samama and he um, and he began shooting uh, travelogues, that sort of thing. Uh, then got hired by I should remember if it's Pate or Gomo, uh, and and came to Europe and filmed a lot on the battlefields of France, and then went back and he's the man who made the first uh, what's considered the first Arab indigenous film, the first African feature film. Uh, but a lot of that material was in Paris. Yeah. So uh, unfortunately. The heritage is, is almost non-existent in, 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 in the MENA region. Um, mismanagement, uh, uh, no climate control, all of these sorts of things. So the, the horrific stories that come out of Egypt. Of, of, uh, and then th selling their heritage to the Saudis, um, who cut Rotana, who cut, who films from the 40s and 50s I'm talking about, mm -hmm. and Rotana cut them so they could be screened on, on television in Saudi, and then we don't know where the original material is. And was the original material cut? Are we ever going to be able to get that complete print back? We don't know. And this is later than, uh, obviously I'm talking about the sound period. So um, in terms of decolonizing, uh, it's hard. Uh, what, what I'm, one of the things I'm always sort of arguing, um, we have to look where the sympathy lies. Where, where are we, who are we engaging with in the film, and in what way are we engaging with them? Are we looking at them as human beings or are we looking at them as the other? And it varies very much, but I find particularly in the earlier films, when, as I said, everything is exotic, there's less of that. It happens later, and it often happens even more in the intertitles. So the pure image can be read one way, but then when you've got the, um, the, the, the introduction of the intertitles as well, which is shifting your focus and shifting how you're thinking about what you've just seen, that's where the real Orientalism begins. Thank you. October in Inshallah. Thank you.